All right. Welcome to another edition of Weather and Climate Chat with Monsoon Mike Regensberger and meteorologist Dr. Michael Davis. Dr. Davis, welcome back. Thank you. Pleasure to have you here as always. Okay, we march on. It's uh, November 13th, Friday the 13th, by the way. Happy Friday the 13th. The third one of the, the third year. The third one of the year. A lot of Friday the 13th this year. It's to the point now where I don't even really hear people talking that much about it. Usually it's a social media thing. Oh, Friday the 13th now. It's like, okay, whatever. So I don't think many people care anymore, but whatever. Good uh, things tend to happen on Friday the 13th. Yeah, and, and weather-wise, we're having some pretty wild winds out there uh, on this uh, Friday the 13th. We had a... Uh, Occluded front come through yesterday and uh, was rocking the house last night. Woke me up around 2, 3 in the morning. I heard it pounding the side of the house. Um, Why is it so windy, Dr. Davis? Uh, A front that passed through uh, last night was associated with a low pressure that was moving across uh, upper New England. And as we record this on... Friday morning yep. is moving across the Canadian Maritimes and out to sea. Uh, there's a high pressure that's building in right behind it across the Great Lakes in the Midwest, which is essentially creating this very tight pressure gradient. When you have a very sharp change in pressure from a very low pressure that just passed last night and a very high pressure that's moving in, you're going to get a tremendous amount of wind. And we're already seeing gusts approaching 30, 35 miles an hour. Mm-hmm. So the winds are quite stiff out there. I wish I would have brought my kite. <laughs> you would definitely, well, you, you might lose your kite today if you're not careful. <laughs> I mean, because kites are generally good around 15, 20, but when you get to the 30, 40, I think that might be a little tough to do a, a kite. But yeah, It's just a windy day, though. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I purposely used a uh, loaded word there because uh, I, uh, only a couple meteorologists actually correctly called yesterday's front an occluded front. Most of them were just saying a front or a cold front. But it actually really was an occluded front, and uh, I heard uh, w- one of the meteorologists down at the National Weather Service pointed that out this past week. I don't know if you saw the discussion. You want to talk a little bit about exa- We hear about warm fronts. We hear about cold fronts. We hear about stationary fronts. What is an occluded front? Uh, an occluded front is a front that essentially has all cold air at the surface right. and warmer air aloft. Uh, Because of differences in temperature, differences in density, the cold fronts tend to travel faster than warm fronts do. Right. So if a cold front is catching up to a warm front and eventually overtakes said warm front, then that warm air gets lifted aloft and all you have is cooler air uh, at the surface. And that cold air is more dense. It doesn't want to move. And... You get, don't get the uplift anymore, so it generally signifies the demise of the low-pressure system. So for all intents and purposes, it really is a cold front, I mean. but You could you, call it a cold if, front, If yes. you want to be technical, you really, though, But yeah. technically, it's a occluded front. That's why on, on my page this past week, I purposely was a smarty pants and just kept calling it an occluded front. And I it, saw that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, they, they do get a different color. On maps, they're, they're purple. Col- they're purple, yes. I saw that pretty purple crossing and, Pennsylvania. And they have the triangles that are yep. associated with the cold front and right. the half circles associated with the warm front on one side. Right. So I thought that was kind of, you know, just try to, I, I try not to be too obscure with my language, like some of the discussions, but I like to, don't want people to get too lazy knowing what's going on. So that's why I threw that out there. Okay, so uh, windy as heck today. Looks pretty still windy tomorrow, too. Uh, yeah, maybe the, not as windy. Maybe we lose in a, a 10 miles an hour or so, but still pretty windy tomorrow. Yeah, the pressure gradient's going to weaken a little bit. That's yeah. going to result from the low pressure continuing to move eastward and also because of the loss of the heating of the day. Right. Because you're getting localized differential temperatures right now because of the sun being out. And when the sun goes down right. at night, you're not having that uh, temperature differential. So the winds tend to diminish right. a little more overnight. So, you know, we'll, we'll lose a little wind tonight, be pretty still gusty tomorrow. Sunday finally looks like we calm down a little bit. Because mm-hmm. um, that's when the high pressure is pretty much influencing our region and right. pretty much anchored in across our area. The good news is it's going to be windy and chilly this weekend, but uh, from a sunshine perspective, compared to a lot of the dreariness we had this past week, pretty bright weekend. So that's pretty nice. Yeah, with high pressures, you typically will get that. Clear skies and... A lot of good radiational cooling, so at night should see our temperatures drop pretty well pretty nice. as well. Uh, and very little wind with okay. high pressure. 
Now, skipping ahead to uh, next week, it looks like we do what we've done almost <laughs> every week the past couple of weeks, shoot right back up temperature-wise. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, the high pressure will be pretty much entrenched across the eastern U.S., and it's going to pretty much divert the jet stream uh, to our north. It's going to be more of a zonal flow, as we call it, which in case it does not have any sorts of ridges and troughs, right. at least major ones for most of the, um, or I should say, the first part of the week, which typically signifies pretty tranquil, stable conditions across the U.S. doesn't really look like much is going to be happening. Right. At least in our neck of the woods. Right. Until about Wednesday or Thursday I next week that. when we get yeah. a big uh, low pressure starting to form across uh, the south central U.S. and then come our way and push the high pressure out to sea probably by about Thursday or so. Now, um, yeah, so it's going to be fairly f- fairly benign weather for the uh, for the coming week. Now, Last week, or I, well, not this past week, but the week prior, both of us were kind of, I think everybody was kind of surprised by how warm it got. I mean, I, I went like five degrees higher than you with my forecast, and even I was blown apart by, uh, you know, whatever it got up to, 78 degrees, whatever. <laughs> Any surprises like that this week, or do you think we're, we tamed it, tame it down a little bit this week? Yeah, I think it's going to be uh, interesting to see what exactly happens with the temperature, yeah. because with high pressures, you typically get a lot of sunshine. Right. But if the high is to our west as it currently is, we typically get more northerly, northwesterly flow. Okay. So it's going to be a cooler air that's being brought down. So it'll be a lot of moderation between the sun that's trying to warm the surface of the earth, but the sun angle is getting lower and lower. Right, lower and lower, yeah. So there's not a lot of energy that's coming in, and you have all this colder air coming in from the north. So I don't see us really having these wild temperatures next week. But then again, I could be wrong. All right, well, let's have a little contest like we did last time. What do you think we're going to peak at? What's our peak temperature? You, you, you do one, and I do one, and we'll see who's, who's closer this time. For the high Yeah, did you just say that the, high, the highest temperature this week. What do you think we're going to peak at for the highest temperature? Uh, somewhere this week? I'm thinking probably 55, 56. Oh, really? Yeah. You don't think we're going to get into the 60s even? No. Okay, because I see the AccuWeather forecast getting into the 60s. Okay. Okay. You take 60, I'll take mid-50s. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go <laughs> 60s. I'm going to go 63. Come on, cold air advection. I yeah, I know. This one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you're, you're definitely the most conservative because I'm seeing some of these guys already saying, oh, it's going to be another, you know, we're cl- getting close to 70 down near Philly, and we'll see. But yeah, I think that might be a little overdone. Yeah. But we shall see. Okay, so you're sticking with the 50s. I'll say, with, I'll say 63. So, all right. okay, we'll see how it goes. Okay, so that's all past. We did our, our fun little stuff, looked at the past, looked at the present. Let's talk about some topics. We got two topics we want to cover in the last segment of this, a national topic and then a uber local topic, something happening right here at Kutztown University. We'll do the national first. Uh, merely minutes after we went off the air last week doing our, our weekly shtick, um, some major news nationally about the Keystone Pipeline. Yes. Talk about that. Uh, For the past seven years, uh, there's been a company in Canada that's been trying to move um, oil from the Alberta tar sands across the U.S. to essentially be put on tankers and shipped overseas. And this was called the Keystone XL Pipeline. And it was last week that President Obama rejected the whole proposal. So in which case the project is not going forward under his administration. But earlier that week, TransCanada did ask for a one-year uh, delay in the process for approval in order probably to see who the next president's going to be and whether they can cater to them. TransCanada's already put about $2 billion with a B into this pipeline, wow. and yeah. it's not going anywhere now, right. at least not through the U.S., so from an environmental standpoint, it was a great victory because it seems as though this administration is actually trying to do something about potential impacts of climate change. Right. Now, the ones that are for the pro side of the Keystone say that it will be a good job promoter. We'd actually have a reliable oil trade partner with Canada as opposed to, say, the Middle East or even that we'd be essentially becoming an exporter of oil. Yeah. And that could benefit our economy by having another commodity that we could be trading. Right. But in the grand scheme of things, it's 
the oil's impact on the climate that I think trumped everything. And I stand by and applaud the president for actually uh, rejecting this pipeline because it would have been catastrophic to the climate as we know it. Was that a play on words when you said trumped everything because Mr. Trump was upset about this? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, n- no, not that. really. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, the lot of Republican candidates came out and this, yeah. vehemently opposed it, saying that yeah. he's standing in the way of the economic growth at the face of something potentially that will not happen. Right. But even though the massive amounts of climate research out there have shown that Indeed, it's something we should be concerned about. Right. There you go. Well, yeah, we, we try to be, avoid being o- too overly political on this show, but I think it's just one of those things that when you have 97% of you know, scientists out there saying you know, that this is happening and this is th- that building this thing would be a threat, um, there's really no denying that. And the, the other thing is that if we are going to be trying to live a more sustainable energy right. life and we need to start getting more greener energy right. into our portfolio, the keystone is not what not we the solution. need. It, but with each month that essentially goes by without passing the keystone or doing something on it, solar cells become more efficient, wind turbines create more power, and more and more people just get more aware of the situation. So right. the longer this thing drags out, the more the environmentalists seem to be gaining traction and we could be seeing a global initiative coming forward out of the uh, Paris talks next month. I want to ask you a quick question, Dr. Davis. And, you know, we, we hear the word, you know, we have the, the right and the left are always battling, you know, the, the big oil people versus the, you know, and then you have the, the really extreme left people, green party people. Oh, it, sh- it should all be wind, en- wind energy, you know, solar. Practically, though, that might be a little bit extreme. I want to touch briefly on nuclear energy. Uh, is that considered like a clean energy? Is that something that maybe we should be focusing more effort, more research into? It is. Yeah. Green energy well, is also considered to be part of the nuclear right. energy. So if you were to have nuclear energy, it doesn't promote any sort of carbon into the atmosphere. Right. So you also have a high amount of potential from one nuclear plant. Right. And personally, I'm very much for nuclear energy. Mm -hmm. I think it's something we need to be looking at more extensively because we're just finding new ways to use energy. We're not really conserving energy. It's just we find new ways to actually use it. So when you start getting countries like the U.S. and the emergence of China, India, and Brazil that are all potentially going to be more energy driven lives. Right. The only way I think you can actually meet that demand is through a high concentration power like nuclear energy. Right. Right. Wind energy, solar energy are all good. Right. And we should be using them. Absolutely. But I think if we're going to be trying to power large metropolitan areas it's going to be very difficult to do that with wind turbines. <laughs> right. <laughs> Unless you have days like this every day. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Just throwing a little joke about that. But no, I, I agree with you, Dr. Davis. And, and my thoughts on nuclear energy have morphed over the years as well. I used to be, oh, I don't want to touch that. That's kind of scary stuff. But then I think to myself, well, it can be scary at times if there's accidents or whatever. But then you invest in you know solutions to prevent them from happening because it's way cleaner than you know building a pipeline from Canada. And so. – yeah, I've also grown up in right. Ohio in the shadow of a nuclear plant. Sure. So yeah. I'm you know it very well. familiar yeah. with the dangers posed by it. Yeah. But if you have the right people with the right knowledge right. operating that facility, you're not going to have an issue. Right. So it's just a matter of directing efforts and money where it should be and not in, in other places. Makes perfect sense. All right, well, we got to move on because we're, we're uh, filling up a lot of time today, which is great. I mean, if we go a little over, that's fine. Wanted to touch on something that's happening here at Kutztown University. Go. Well, every year across the United States, you have the National uh, Geography Awareness Week, yep. which aims to raise geography awareness in the populations at the university and even in local communities. Uh, Kutztown's no different. We're going to be having a whole bunch of activities that the Geography Department and the Geographical Society at Kutztown University are offering. And I just want to highlight some of the events that will be uh, 
uh, running this uh, upcoming week. On Monday, November 16th, there's going to be a bake sale in Bay Lobby uh, from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Come on by and buy a bake sale good and contribute to the club. And then on Tuesday, November 17th at 11 a.m., in Graduate Center Room 2, we're going to have a special guest speaker, Sarah Weigel. She's one of our alums, and she's going to be giving a talk uh, entitled Standing at the Crossroads, How an Internship Can Help Map Your Future, about how you can get internships and how they can essentially help you get a job in geography. At 7 p.m. in the BAME lobby, we're going to have a geography trivia night. Teams of two to four. You can, don't have to be a geography major for it. You can show up, and there will be prizes. I believe we have some bear bucks to give away. Cool. And there will be uh, food, some refreshments, and a lot of uh, geography trivia games. And I'm supplying some of the meteorology, climatology, and physical geography questions. We're going to have some cultural geography questions. We're going to have some mapping questions. All sorts of fun times to be had. And then on Wednesday, November 18th at 5.30... In BAME 262, there's going to be a special guest speaker, Dr. Matthew Wilson, who's an associate professor of geography at University of Kentucky, who's giving a lecture entitled Pay Attention, Mapping and Media, looking at how you can use mapping in a uh, more of a media approach, whether it be on a uh, social networking or even in perhaps a a mobile device. Mm -hmm. And then on Thursday, November 19th, at 530 in the Bears Den Gallery at the Union, we're going to have a geocaching contest that the students can participate in and find hidden treasures around campus. And there are bear bucks up for grabs as well for that. Got to get those bear bucks, yep. And then at 7 p.m. in BAME 260, there's going to be a special showing of the movie documentary Gasland, which oh, deals okay. with uh, fracking in Pennsylvania. Yep, yep, big, big and, issue. And... Um, those are the activities that we have for the upcoming week. Now, is this all like written down somewhere on a website or on a Facebook page or something in case you missed any of that? Uh, I do not know if it's on our uh, department website, Okay, but there are flyers aplenty about uh, right. the Graduate Center and the Union. I want to take Bain. a picture of or get a copy of that before you leave just in case I need it. Oh, certainly. I so. think I have it somewhere in my email. I think Dorothy might have sent something out. Shout out to Dorothy. She and happy birthday, Dorothy. That's right. Today's bir- Dorothy's birthday. Happy birthday, Dorothy. Um, one of our big fans and your loyal secretary, mm-hmm. department secretary. Um, yeah, so great. And uh, we'll be promoting that. And uh, any any events for kids? Because I know uh, sometimes there's like little events for families to bring their kids along. Uh, I'd... Or any any events that you would not, maybe not just focused at kids, but appropriate to bring kids. What would you say? Uh, uh, I'd say the geocaching event okay. would d- definitely be one. Okay. Get uh, Learn some uh GPS okay. uh, orienteering, perhaps, and location, and just find treasures around campus. Okay, cool. I asked because I have kids, and they're definitely interested in science, and I brought them a couple weeks ago. To, they had a family night for chemistry night, I think it was. I don't know if you heard about that, and I brought them f- for that, and they had a good time with that. All right. Of course, the bake sale. Always good. Hey, there you go. There. That's that's any age, zero to 100. <laughs> you know, everybody likes good food, right? Mm-hmm. All right, so that's great. So check out the flyers. We will. I will make sure to get co- a copy from you, and we will. Pro- we, we will be promoting it if I can get my words out um, a lot over the coming days, and of course on this little segment which we air every week, weather and climate chat with Dr. Michael Davis and Monsoon Mike. So, Dr. Davis, thank you so much for joining us again. Thanks for having me. And uh, maybe one of these days we'll get a guest on the air. We've had a little bit of hard time I getting will somebody try. to talk. <laughs> Get a little, you know, but say it's not just always us talking, but that's okay. Uh, And we'll uh, see you again next week. Bye.